sanctuary. Um, last week, we, oh, actually, for the last maybe a couple of months now, we've been talking about the kingdom of heaven. We started with the citizens of heaven, and last week we ended up with possessing the kingdom. Oh boy, it's been a, it's, it's a journey. <laughs> it's a journey, uh, number one, to know that yes, I am a citizen of heaven, and then to start to think of, okay, what does that really mean? Uh, what is the practical uh, application of, of being a citizen of heaven? How does that show up in my life? How is my life different? Uh, 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 as I've uh, kind of thought about those words, citizen of heaven. And so we talked about the possession, possessing the things of heaven. Uh, because, hey, listen, if you're going to conquer the world, uh, you have to conquer the world with greater powers. The powers of heaven over the powers of this world. So today we're going to keep on talking about the kingdom. And we want to talk about the ways that God advances his kingdom through us. How does the Lord expand and advance his kingdom? That's really what we want to dig in today. Because if you're not advancing and expanding, guess what's going on? You're retracting. That's right. You're backsliding and contracting. The kingdom of God cannot contract. <laughs> it cannot get smaller. It's got to get bigger. Because the Bible says that the glory fills the whole world. The glory of God. Now some may say, well, I don't sense the glory of God. I don't see the glory of God. Um, and, and Paul says, you know, uh, look up at the stars. <laughs> That's part of the glory of God. Just look around you. The glory of God is everywhere you are. Mm -hmm. The glory of God is everywhere. Though you may say, oh, I don't see the glory of God. But what has happened here in this world is this. In the book of Daniel, the Bible talks about uh, the prince of Persia. Anyone recall that, that, that passage that talks about the prince of Persia? Okay. Yeah, there was a gift that God was bringing down, a gift of understanding and revelation to uh, Daniel. And by the time the angel came, 21 days later, guess what the angel said? The prince of Persia opposed me. Yeah, came against me. Um, why did the prince of Persia come against the angel that was bringing the revelation to Daniel if it wasn't something so significant and so mighty. Why? Why the opposition? I mean, nobody opposes somebody that is bringing uh, pennies, right? If I'm bringing uh, a couple of cents to somebody, I'm not opposed. But if somebody sees me with a bag full of cash, I better be very careful, right? <laughs> I better be very, very careful because people oppose that kind of person because they say, oh wow, he has a lot of money. And so they come against me trying to steal. Well, it's the same thing. The prince of Persia came against um, uh, 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 the angel that was coming with the gift. How can the kingdom of heaven be expanded if this wars are not fought and won? How can the kingdom of heaven be expanded when the territory that belongs to the prince of Persia is not taken back? It's got to be taken back. How is it taken back? God wants to advance his kingdom. He wants to advance his kingdom. That's, when, that's why when Jesus Christ healed a person, he says, the kingdom has come upon you. Why? Because what was operating in that person in the atmosphere and in the person, what was operating at the time was uh, the kingdom of darkness was operating. The Bible says Jesus came in order, to, in order to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus came, that's one reason why Jesus came, to destroy the works of the devil. What are the works of the devil? Sickness, cancers, mind control, brainwashing, um, sin, all kinds of things to try to limit God's kingdom. But Jesus came to destroy it and expand his kingdom. Amen. And so this is part of what we wanted to, actually this is the message today. How is it? 
how does it happen? How does God expand his kingdom? In every one of us, God wants to do the same thing. God wants to expand his kingdom in us. The Bible calls it, we grow from glory to glory. That's an expansion. <laughs> you know, it's expansion. I grow from faith to faith. It's an expansion. I grow from revelation to revelation. That means God is expanding me. He's expanding me. Um, those, are, those are the areas. God conquers my fear. I'm able to overcome fear. Man, that's an expansion because right now, then I have freedom. Freedom to do things that I couldn't do before. Somebody that has fear of swimming, for example, a natural example. Someone has fear of the water and God helped them to conquer it. Guess what? Now they're free. When they see water, it's not, you know, anymore. It's like, it's a freedom. You know, that's what expansion brings. It brings freedom. It brings freedom. And God wants to set all of us up, all of us free. How does he do it? Expansion, 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 expansion. In the natural world, the British Empire did it. They expanded it. They occupied many nations. That's what the British Empire did. Not only before the British did it, the Egyptians did it. You know, they owned a significant portion of this world. Mm -hmm. And then the Romans did it. The Vikings. Did yeah, it. the Vikings did it. Yeah, all these people did it. They conquered a significant portion and they advanced their kingdom. If they hadn't, the kingdom might be very small. Can you imagine? If there was no expansion of some of these places that we call Great Britain uh, or we call even the United States, through war, this place was expanded, expanded through war. And so it was, it was this, it's, it's exactly what God wants to do in us and through us as people. He wants to expand his kingdom in us and through us. And so today we're going to talk more about that. And so, Sophia? My yes, beloved, sir. <laughs> the old word that the Lord has given you. All right. Expanding the kingdom of heaven. Got it. There's a couple things that came to me as you were talking, because it of always course. does. That's why I always <laughs> like you when you go first, because God always speaks so much, especially after a prayer like that. But I want to say this thing, because Jesus Christ came to fight the works of the enemy, right? To fight the devil. And the devil steals, kills, and destroys. So that means that Jesus Christ and God gives, uh, revives, and restores. I like that. Wow. He gives, he revives, and he restores. Those are the opposites of stealing, killing, and destroying. And so what we're fighting is for uh, forgiving, for reviving, and for restoring the kingdom. And through that expansion. And what came to me as you were talking about, yeah, the, the glory of God. And I was always expanding, expanding, expanding. Kind of like uh, the universe. I wrote an essay about the shape of the universe once. I was wondering what shape the universe was. It was my through a very long essay. And uh, but anyways, one of the theories is that the universe is expanding. Mm -hmm. Some people believe in like the Big Bang. You can think of God as the Big Bang. He's always expanding, expanding, expanding. He's limitless, basically. There's not a limited amount of resources with God. He's always expanding and expanding and expanding and expanding. And the problem with the devil is that he's not. Hmm. It might look like he is, he might uh, have more people, but see, he was given the earth to live. The earth is not expanding. In fact, it seems like it's getting smaller with overpopulation and all that. So his power is much less than God's power. And so I praise God for that because we live in the spirit. Uh, even though we are foreigners of this land, we can always expand. And we fight over land in the, in the countries and things like that, but we forget about the spiritual land that the devil has stolen from us mm -hmm. and what he has taken over and stolen from our part of the heavenly kingdom. And so today, I'm excited to talk about this uh, uh, expanding the kingdom in us because I want to expand in him. I want to grow and grow with him, and I want to go up to the seventh heaven and then back. I want to be like John and have these crazy uh, visions of the end times, and I want to know what I can do while I'm here, just like John knew what he had to do when he wrote everything down. Yes. Without him seeing the end of the world, we wouldn't have the book of Revelation, and we wouldn't have had that insight. 
And so knowing that God gave those revelations and those visions to one man that was in the world wow. to give the vision of the end of times. Wow. wow. And we say, wow. You know, we say, oh, I don't, I don't see anything. I don't do anything. And, and, you know, we question what we see. When we see it, we just say, oh, that's just crazy talk. If I was John and I was seeing some of those things, I would wonder if I had a demon in me. Oh, that's right. so <laughs> I'm seeing all, all, kinds all kinds of darkness, all, all kinds of things like this, but he didn't. And he wrote it down because he trusted, because he had been expanded. And he knew that even though I haven't seen it, uh, it's uh, going to expand in me. Okay. I just want to make sure. Yeah. yeah. No, we're good. And so I, I love the fact that I've forgotten everything that I was going to talk about after that prayer of yours. <laughs> I just shook it all out of me, so I don't know That's what we're going to hear tonight. That's good. <laughs> but thank Praise God, God we do have scripture. But before we go into expanding the kingdom, I want to talk about one example where uh, the kingdom expanded and then what happened after that. And it's we're going to be talking about a different man than uh, what we preached about, but it's still a rich, young ruler. Mm. So we're going back to a rich, young ruler. Not the same scripture, but think about this, because... This is a man that was a rich, young ruler, and he loved God, and he was close to God, and he conquered a lot of land with God's help, and he was loyal to the Lord. And what happened is that glory came before suffering. And we're going to look into the scriptures more deep because I know that with a lot of knowledge and with a lot of power that God has given you by supporting you and giving you uh, possessions and blessings and gifts of the Holy Spirit and uh, uh, respect from God, it's important to place that in uh, the right place, which is upstairs, <laughs> not in here, you know? And so we're going to be talking about King uh, Uzziah. Uzziah. Uzziah, I see it always wrong, so <laughs> forgive me. <laughs> and we have a lot of scripture to cover, as always, so we're going to start in 2 Chronicles 26. Uzziah's reign in Judah. Now, I will be reading, but I will be reading kind of fast, but I know that there's some things that God wants to point out, and I want you to pay attention to the details, and I'll make them clear to you as I read it, because this is going to lead into a different scripture to kind of close it in at the end. But this is King Uzziah. And before, uh, there was a king uh, that was called Amasiah? Yeah. Yes. Messiah. And uh, he was the uh, son of Joash, king of Judah. And he was supposed to be king. But then, in verse 1 of chapter 26, it says, Now all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old. So, okay, they have a son that's in place to be uh, the next king. But the people took Uzziah. Wow, already it's like, you know, uh, the people took Uzziah at 16, but God, through Samuel, took David. Mm -hmm. And he was like led into the wilderness for a lot of suffering <laughs> before he could be king, oh, wow. and then ended up being a great king. And so the people, not God, the people took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king instead of his father, Amaziah. So they skipped a generation. Hmm. At 16. I wonder what made the people do that? What kind of reputation did he already have amongst the people? And what had his father done that made them say, no way, we don't want him. We want this 16-year-old inexperienced guy who's never been to battle, who hasn't achieved much of anything. He certainly hasn't uh, experienced a lot of life or had a lot of leadership role. I don't imagine a 16-year-old being in any kind of high position in the army or as a commander or anything like that. And so I wonder, why did the people choose him? Hmm. Sometimes uh, what people say about that, because it makes me think of our generation. Some people say, well, he, uh, if you have uh, two, they say if you have two evil people, you see, you choose the lesser of the evil person. Yeah. You know, in a current uh, political climate, mm -hmm. that's what some people say. They yeah. Say, well, that's just Maybe it was between lesser. Trump and Hillary. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that was just wondering, but wow. No, I'm just kidding, I'm not yeah. political, but it was yeah. just a funny joke. But I, I just want you to pay attention to that because as as we go on, he, do, he doesn't have that 
reputation built up. He doesn't have the experiences. Like David, he actually was in the army after he slew Goliath, and he had a lot of success in the de defeat, defeating a lot of the enemies of Israel at that time. But as far as we're concerned, there's nothing recorded. Hmm. And so he, he built Elah and restored it to Judah after the king rested with his father. Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king, and he reigned for 52 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was uh, Jecoliah of Jerusalem. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father and Messiah had done. So he was not a wicked king. He was a king that knew God and that wanted to be close to God. He started very well, very well. As we go on, you'll see how well he started. Not only did he do what was right, but he sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God, and as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. Wow, there's a lot to digest in this one, because uh, he, sought the, he sought God in the days of Zechariah, and he had understanding in the visions. So not only did he believe in God and seek God, he also didn't doubt or belittle the visions that were coming at the time. He trusted the prophets, and he sought them for visions and for wisdom. This was not an unwise man. This was not a, a man that can claim ignorance, that's what we're saying. He had knowledge. He had much knowledge, too much knowledge. He had too much knowledge. Just gave him a lot. Yes, he had visions, he sought God, and as long as he sought God, God made him prosper. I like that. So what does is, what is seeking God mean? What does seeking, it doesn't say as long as he uh, was one with God, as long as he sought the Lord. That doesn't mean that he didn't have sin. That doesn't mean that he didn't have days of being down. It doesn't mean that he didn't have days of being attacked, because if he really was uh, following God, surely he was also attacked, right? Yes. And so he had bad days, yes, he had sin, but his heart was seeking to please God and to do what is right in the eyes of God. And no matter, uh, I shouldn't say no matter what we do, but when we have that heart for God, there's very little that we can do wrong in the world. If we're doing right by in our kingdom of the Spirit and expanding in the Spirit, expanding in the Spirit, what we do here on this world, in this limited, it's easy for God to excuse. And He won't even mention it. It's easy. It's easy for God to forgive sin when you are moving towards Him in the Spirit. Now, people that are moving towards Him also don't want to be moving against Him in the world because we live in one and the same place. Yeah, it reminds me before you go on of another verse in Second Chronicles 69, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show Himself strong yes. on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to Him. So apparently the heart of this man, Uzziah, was loyal. It was loyal. As loyal. long as he sought the Lord. Now I want you to really think about this because so many times we feel that we don't seek God enough. Right? Yeah. But see, you either seeking or not seeking. There's no, I need to seek more and more and more. God will take care of taking that faith to faith to faith. The devil is the one that makes, wants to make you feel guilty and say, Oh, well, I didn't seek the Lord between the hours of 3 and 5 today. I did my own thing. No, no, no. You can't. Uh, not seek the Lord with your heart when you love Him and you're wanting to get there. And the enemy will make you focus on your sin, even though he is looking at your heart. So we're focusing on our sin and our in in inabilities and our where we have failed God. But he focuses as long as this right here is for him. That's forgiven. He shows himself. He shed his blood, right? He shed his blood. Now, I'm not excusing sin or saying you should go ahead and sin, but I'm saying anybody that has a heart that wants to move closer to God will not excuse sin like that. That's right. They also won't condemn themselves. They also will not condemn themselves. They will reject that enemy voice when it comes. So as long as he sought the Lord, think about that word, sought the Lord. Uh, seeking the Lord is not sitting like this all day. Because you can be reading your Bible for 24 hours a day and still not seeking God. Oh, yeah. You could be praying 24 hours a day and not seeking God. So many times that's how most people pray. They pray for their own will, not for God's will. And they don't like what they hear, and so then they blame God. Seeking the Lord is seeking His perfect will for you, not you telling God what to do. Not you complaining about what God is not doing. Also, uh, 
you can seek the Lord in an obligatory way. Oh yes. Out of obligation. And, yeah. and that comes out of false guilt. Yes, exactly. So you say, oh, I only was seeking it for five hours. I got to do longer. You look at your watch before. I'm, I'm telling you, God can do uh, more in five minutes uh, than sometimes it takes people ten hours. God is, and, not, and nothing is impossible with Him. I'm not saying if you're, if you're led to, to do things for a certain amount of time, but there is no time with God. Time doesn't exist with God. So if you're saying, oh, I didn't spend this time and this time, this, you're already not thinking what God is thinking. Because this, going towards there, there's no time. Eternity, right? <clears throat> Jesus was, He is, and He is to come. That's right. And so this cannot be uh, limited by time. Neither will you feel good, if, or and if you do feel good after praying for 10 hours straight, well then uh, you'll see what happens to that kind of person <laughs> later <laughs> on. And so now he went, this is how God prospered him because he was seeking the Lord and he was for God. And so he waged war against all these people. And I'm going to uh, summarize a little bit just so we can see the, the, the manifestations of God's blessing upon him and the way that God made him prosper. He didn't say that he uh, sought the Lord in everything he did. He just made him prosper because of his heart. He broke down the wall of Gath, the wall of Jabani, and the wall of Ashdod. And he built cities around Ashdod among the Philistines. God helped him against the Philistines, against the Arabians who lived uh, in Golbar, and brought and against the Maronites. Uh, I'm so sorry, all these people. <laughs> forgive me in heaven. Also, the Amorites brought tribute to Uzziah. So even the Gentiles are bringing tribute to this mighty king. He reigned for 52 years. They, even the Gentiles brought tribute to him, and his fame spread as far as the entrance of Egypt, for he became exceedingly strong. Not just strong, exceedingly strong. He became exceedingly strong. Remember that word strong. Because God continu continues to bless him. He built towers in Jerusalem. And then he fortified them. And he built towers in the desert. And he dug many wells. For he had much livestock. Both in the lowlands and the plains. He also had farmers and vine dressers in the mountains and in Carmel. For he loved the soil. Let's remember what is Satan? The earth. So already we should, we should, uh, I'll connect the dots, already we should be thinking about what's happening uh, to King uh, Uzziah here. Because uh, he dug many wells and he had much livestock. I want you to remember all these words for where we're going. The, the vineyards and the farmers and the, how he fortified the cities and how he loved the earth, the soil. Again, he said in the beginning he sought God, and then he was with God, and all of a sudden now, it's not bad to be a farmer, it's not bad to be a gardener, it's not bad, but I want us to also know that we're reading the Holy Bible, not uh, the home, home and gardening newspaper, you know? This is God's Word. It has significance. The serpent was destined to dust because he divorced God. So let's be, keep that in mind. Moreover, Uzziah had an army of fighting men who went out to war by companies and they had lots, lots of officers and kings. And let's skip down to verse 13. And under their authority was an army of 307,500 that made war with mighty power to help the king against the enemy. Not to help God against the enemy, to help the king against the enemy. Let's, let's see where this is going. Let's digest it a little bit because we want to skip to the very end and say, oh wow, he did one thing. He reigned for 52 years. Huh. And he, that he helped the king against the enemy. I wonder who became his enemy. Who was his enemy at this point in time? The scripture doesn't tell us everything. Then Isaiah prepared for them. For the entire army, he gave them all this armory. And look at how clever he was too. He made devices in Jerusalem invented by skillful men to be on the towers and on the corners to shoot arrows and large stones. Wow, so he was a, a very smart businessman. He got the smartest people to invent the best 
of powers. It's like uh, what, it's like Albert Einstein creating the nuclear bomb. Oh yeah, we got all these inventors, you know, creating nuclear bombs. Now we can kill more people with less of us getting hurt. And so his his fame spread far and wide, for he was marvelously helped till he became strong. I always thought that he became strong at that moment. But we can look back and see in verse 8, for he became exceedingly strong in verse 8. Yeah. So did he become Till strong? he became strong. I'm just saying, we don't know. Uh, was he doing all, he talks about what he was doing for God up until verse 8, and then all of a, all of a sudden, the tone changes to uh, doing uh, things of the earth, and uh, the king against the enemy. And so I want us to not judge God's word and just say, that is when he became strong. Because the enemy doesn't, uh, uh, let's see, he's not always quick to kill you. Because then you'll know you're under attack. Oh, yeah. He's not always quick to kill you. He'll give you just a little seed. He's Chew strategic. on that one. He's strategic. And he wants to make you more hungry for that power, mm -hmm. for that uh, authority, for the fame, for the glory. Mm -hmm. So just remember that we don't know exactly what happened under these under these years when he was rising and rising and rising in fame and power, for he was marvelously helped till he became strong. Mm -hmm. God forbid we ever become strong like that. <laughs> strong in God, not strong in ourselves, not yeah. strong in our army, not strong in what we've done here on earth. He expanded the kingdom, uh, his own kingdom, but he also cursed Judah by his actions. And what was, what's, what's about to happen. And there was a penalty for his pride. And the penalty for his pride goes on here in verse 16. But when he was strong in his heart, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God by entering the temple of God to burn incense on the altar of incense. Oh, wow. Let's take a break there for a minute because there's lots to talk about. Ha! Huh. How, what would lead a king that has so much, that has conquered so much, that has so much fame and so many admirers, and has had success and been marvelously helped in everything, why does he want to go into the temple? That's one place where perhaps uh, he feels less and he wants to be admired that place just as he wants to be admired in other places. Remember, the power of God was with him in the early part of the chapter. The power of God was with him when he was seeking God. He had the power of God. And what happened in the middle, we don't know all the details, but obviously something must have left him. Something had left him for him to feel the need to go into the temple and take the role of a priest when he was a king. Hmm. Right? What was he missing? What had he allowed to leave him in order for him to feel, wow, I have everything under the sun. I own this land. I have all these vineyards. I have all this land. I can till the soil. I can do all this. But he felt the need to go into the temple and burn incense when he knew very, very well, he knew too much, he knew he should not go in there. A king cannot do a priest's job when they're not told to be a priest or a prophet. Just like a prophet can't be a king unless they've been ordained to be both. Yeah. In some cases there are. Yeah. But in some cases this man was not a priest and he was not a prophet and he was not allowed to go into the holy place. Hmm. He already had God in his heart before. Wow. He already had the power of God in him when he was seeking him. As long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. Prosper doesn't always mean that you're winning every war in the world. Prosper doesn't always mean that you win every single fight against men. You look at countries in Africa, they're surely not prospering in the world, right? But they're some of the most zealous for God that there are. In America, we prosper, right? We prosper. Or do we? Do we really prosper? 
the prosperity that God gave him in the earlier part of the chapter was not in uh, building up the land and having all this livestock and having all this and that. But yeah, obviously God showed mercy for a long time. Remember, God is long-suffering. He's not just like, what, you stepped a little? He knows what's been going on already. He has seen the heart. Like we said, if you're not pressing forwards, you're automatically going backwards. So I don't want us to assume that all these things that was given to him when, when he was with God, we don't know because there's no mention that of God in, after verse 8. It just says he became exceedingly strong. And tying that in that God was with him marvelously until he became strong. Well, God showed me a different angle on this, on this scripture. And just uh, in the same way, that sickness sometimes takes a while to kill a person. The devil takes a while for it to manifest in you when you've been poisoned by him. And so here we go. He's lost the power of God. He's lost God's presence in his heart because his heart was lifted up. It was made strong. And so he says, I am, I am mighty. I made this country. I dug these wells. I, I planted these vineyards. I built these towers. I created all these uh, uh, weapons that we can prosper. I fortified the city. I did it all. But he's weak in the spirit. And so he looks at the priests who still have God in them. They have the power of God in them. They have the presence of the Holy Spirit in them. They have something that he once had that has now been lost. And so he's mad. He's mad and he's jealous because he is the king and they're the priests. And how hard is your job? You just go and burn incense and do this, right? And sit down and pray. I go to war. I fight. I do everything. I provide for you. I pay for you. I respected you. I gave you a house to live in. I gave you all these things for free. And all you do is just this. You just clean the temple. <laughs> I can do that, he says. Because the Levites were not uh, allowed to work. They were a nope. direct inheritance of the Lord. Yes. And so um, the way that they were able to take care of themselves is through the um, generosity of others. Mm -hmm. To show that this was happening in mm -hmm. this case. And also remember that he had had the uh, admiration and the uh, sucking up, whatever you want to call it, of all the people. Even the Gentiles came to admire him and to give tribute to him. Hmm. But these priests were not unholy priests. They were given tribute to God. Yeah. And that probably stung a little too, especially when everyone else is coming in and saying, oh wow, you, you don't uh, bow down and worship me? How hard is your job? You just go in, you do this, and you call to God, I knew God, I know of God, I can surely do it. So this is what he did. Again, we need to look at the heart. There's many things that in the early years of his life that were forgiven and not mentioned in verses 1 through 7. There's no sin mentioned. He did wonderful. Even though, I'm sure, he had many sins just like you and I do. But God can overlook that when your heart is pointed towards him because you know the shadow of your heart covers all that. Because <laughs> you have Jesus in your heart. He can't see it. And the, the love of God in you covers a multitude of sins. Yes. Yeah. My favorite scripture. Wow. My favorite scripture is found in Job 22, 29 through 30. And I'll, uh, if you want to look it up. Job 22, 29 through 30. This is my favorite scripture. Um, today. <laughs> I'm going to change the subject. I'm going to change about today. You know, the season that I'm in. And the season that I've been in. Because to me this just speaks to the grace of God, the forgiveness of God, the love of God. That he uh, forgives. And he says, even though you are not innocent, you've been justified. You can read it word by word. Yeah, uh, verse 29. When they cast you down. And you say, exaltation will come. Then he will save the humble person. He will even deliver one who is not innocent. Amen. <laughs> yes. 
He will be delivered Amen. by the purity of your hands. Amen. Wow. Sometimes we look at that and say, is this a typo? He will even deliver one who is not innocent. Praise God, I say. I say, I claim that in Jesus' name. Not innocent. Remember that this king uh, grew strong in his heart. He became to justify himself, not be justified by God. In the early years, he sought God, and he may not have been innocent, but he was justified by God. Remember, he had no experience in leadership. God has grace. He was not innocent, but he was justified. And then as he rose up and decided to take some of that glory that God was giving him and letting his heart rise up and be strong, yeah. he justified himself and automatically he fell into not innocent anymore. Mm. Mm. I'd rather be not innocent and justified by God than yes. think that I am innocent and justify myself. Oh, yes. Oh. I'm not going to justify myself. I'll let God defend me, not me defend myself. That's right. I'll join the accuser one day and say, oh, no, I did worse than that. You just missed that one. <laughs> <laughs> but God knows my heart. That's right. Hmm. Wow. And so I love, I love that, that God looks at this, the kingdom that is in the spirit. You know, we have a body that's here and our, our flesh is prone to sin. That's just how it is. But my spirit is not. <laughs> What I always tell you is like, my flesh fails, but my spirit will never fail. My spirit will never fail, not because of me, but because who he is to me. And so I find that most encouraging. And so what happens then now that he's entered the temple to burn incense at the altar? We can imagine the anger that he has, that he's lost God's presence in his life. That no longer is he satisfied with the, uh, the adoration of men. No longer is that he satisfied by looking at all the land and all the plants and all the wells and all the towers and all the cities that he's fortified. No longer is he uh, satisfied with all the livestock and the lowlands and the high plainlands and the soil that he's been given and all the mighty armies and all the shields and all the inventions that he's been given. He's no longer satisfied. Yeah. What do we have that makes us feel unsatisfied? What has God made us prosper in and yet we say, I want more? Yeah, it's a point of diminishing returns. Yes. After a while, the things no longer satisfy you and you want something else, something else, something else. But, but there's a point where it comes to the point where Solomon said, it's all that vanity. It's that all is vanity. vanity. Yeah. And you see, this is the same kind of thing uh, come out here, but he takes it out in anger and wants to gain it back by force. Ooh. By force. We'll get into it now. Now it gets really interesting. And so then, as Ahara, uh, sorry again, Lord, uh, the priest went in after him, and with him were 80 priests of the Lord. 80 priests of the Lord! They saw what this uh, king that had become uh, lifted up for his own destruction and transgressed against the Lord. 80 priests rose up against a king! Praise God! Praise God! Not to condemn him, not to cast judgment on him, to save his soul. To save him. And they rose up to save him. Yeah, and as you rightly said, this were eighty priests that were being fed by this king. Yes. And can you imagine to have the courage to stand up against the person that's been feeding you and housing you, knowing that if you say something against him, you might be cast out. Oh. But having the boldness to say, hey, stop it. You're they right. were not false prophets. They were not false prophets. That's what the false prophets do. They just give whatever visions they want to hear. <laughs> True prophets are like, ah, you're about to die. Yeah. Stop it. Yeah. Oh. And so 80 priests of the Lord, valiant men, it says, and they withstood King Uzziah and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have trespassed. You shall have no honor from the Lord God. Wow. Those were not said in a nice way. Those, were not, those words were not saying, please, you know, you're stepping on holy ground, you might, your feet might burn. They're stepping into their authority as instruments of God and giving him a strong warning. If someone is about to fall off a cliff, Alex, how would you stop them? 
would you say, eh, excuse me, you see a blind man walking, right? He's about to be walking. <laughs> How would you stop that guy? He's walking like this. He's completely lost God. It's like, where am I going? He's about to fall. How would you voice that? Like, yell at him? Yeah!
That happened right then. People want to say, oh, he just woke up one day and wanted to burn incense. No, there's a story behind the story. What would lead a king to do such an act after having loved God? It's not like he's a fool. He knows the rules. And he respected them for a long time, but he's lost his first love. He's lost his first love, and so he wants to gain it back by force. Ushaya raped the church. He went in and he raped the church. By force. By force. By the force. priest tried to stop him. He tried to say no, but he didn't take no for an answer. And he said, I'll do it anyways. Hmm. Oh, wow. And God did not forgive that. Then he struck him with leprosy right away. And it showed up on his forehead like the mark of the beast. Hmm. <laughs> Usually leprosy comes up in the extremities first, not on the forehead. Yeah. It starts in your fingers and your toes. You know, it doesn't go on your forehead right away. It spreads inwards. And so, uh, huh. to see that God did that, that he was leprous. And so, as soon as they saw that, they thrusted him out of that place. And indeed, he also hurried to get out, because the Lord had struck him. King Uzziah was a leper until the day of his death. Hmm. Either he repented and God had just shut the door, or he didn't repent at all. Do you think he repented? No, I don't. No, oh, okay. So. Yeah, I don't think so either. No. Again, I don't know, but I also uh, know what, what God has said about some unforgivable things. And they will come crying to me at night, and I will not listen to them, because they've done so much evil in my eyes. And so those same eyes that look at you and I and see a spirit and a heart that, I just want to please you, Lord. How about how he looks at a spirit that says, I just myself. Uh-oh, you've just done this, and you've exposed all this. Yeah. <laughs> Instead Let's... of letting your shadow cover some of that uh, not being innocent, yeah. it's now exposing everything. Yeah. This man had fallen into the sin of Satan. Yes. Satan also started well. Yes. And it was not until later that he lifted his heart up against God, mm -hmm. and God cast him out. Mm -hmm. And you see the words here in verse 21, uh, where he says, he dwelt in an isolated house because mm -hmm. he was a leper, for he was cut off mm -hmm. from the house of the Lord. Mm -hmm. He was cut off. He was pruned off so that the tree of God can have much more fruit. And I'm sorry, you can't really connect a, a, a cut limb to a tree. Wow. He's cut off. Wow, wow, wow. You know what's interesting about this is, again, this is very for, again, people in that generation. Uh, when we look at this story, we say, wow, this, was, this seemed like a, a, a man of God. He was a man of God. He, mm -hmm. was, he was faithful. Uh, and again, we might look at the sin and say, wow, but it wasn't like he murdered somebody. Uh, it wasn't like he, you know, he, he didn't commit what we think are atrocious sins abominable sin. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? He didn't do any of that. In fact, he, to me, when I read the I have a certain, a bit of a compassion for this man, a little bit, because I just hate to see someone that loved God so much and fall into, well. yeah, fall into such a trap. Mm -hmm. And in, in the eyes of man, you say, well, uh, I mean, you, you know, say, well, you know, he didn't do something that was so horrible. He's not Hitler. He didn't kill six million people. But he did. Yeah. But he did. See, we want to look at this and say he didn't kill anyone, yeah. but the judgment that Isaiah gave on him, which we're going to go into real quick after we're done with this, there was judgment over all of Judah because of what he did. Oh, okay. <laughs> they were in poverty. Yeah. I mean, they, we may not see it as if he in intentionally killed someone, but because of this atrocious act and his heart that went from good to wicked, an entire nation was judged. Oh, wow. Okay. and suffered through famine, and uh, the land dried up, and all these things, and then they were taken conquered again. And so we don't see God's greater plan, and He sees all that, but we don't. And we say, hey, do, you know, we can sweep up that. Yeah, we, can, also, we can do wrong. Yeah, because we try to compare the sin of this man, Uzziah, that was a man of God. You know, you say, well, you know, I mean, yeah, I, I, I know that he did something he wasn't supposed to do. Yes, he rose up in pride, but... Compared to Hitler that killed six million Jews, that's this this thing doesn't seem. He knew nothing. Yeah. That because he was a man of God, yeah. because he had seen the Lord's hand on his life oh, yeah. that had made him prosper, he'd been seeking God, he'd been seeking visions from the God, he had helped the priests, he'd done too much yeah. to say, 
He knew what God was going to do. See, the thing about committing sin when you don't know what God is going to do to you, uh, that's ignorance, right? Ignorance uh, kills people, by the way, but you don't know what's going to happen. He knew what was going to happen. And so the Lord struck him with leprosy on the forehead right away, and he went into isolation. Hmm. The thing about leprosy is that it spreads. That's why he had to live in isolation. And so we can look at Uzziah. Uh, many pastors that I've heard preach on this message say that we all have Uzziahs in us, right? And they need to die. So, but it's kind of like preaching the same thing I'm like trying to say. It's like, yes, we all have faults. And I, I, they can't all die. You know, then they'll come a new one or another one, another one. And I'll keep doing this, whipping myself as if I'm, I have to be crushed like Jesus Christ. I'm not saying don't examine yourself, don't become better and better and better, but to say that uh, King Uzziah is uh, uh, something in you, King Uzziah is a person and it's a representation of what's about to happen in the kingdom because when one great king falls, God is able to do mighty miracles. God is able to do mighty miracles when one wicked king goes down. God is able to do mighty miracles when the leper <laughs> dies. The leper needs to die. Instead of thinking as Uzziah is being part of in us, you can make that claim, but you've heard that message. Let's look at Uzziah as a, a congregation. <laughs> Let's think of Uzziah as a church instead of a nation. A church can start out oh, excellent, seeking the Lord, right? But then one man rises up in his heart and he becomes leprous, right? And he becomes... Uh, he starts to justify himself. I went to seminary. My father was a pastor. My grandfather was a pastor. I have never committed those sins. Remember the rich song? I have never done any of these things. I have been married for 35 years. I have three wonderful kids, and uh, I tie every Sunday, and I wear a tie, and you know, my wife wears an apron when she cooks dinner. It's like you're justifying yourself. Yeah. Uzziah could be a representation of the church today. That's all I'm saying. They was great when they were seeking God, and God made them prosper. And the city grew, and they had walls, and then all of a sudden they're creating weapons of mass destruction, and one leper can toxify an entire church. Oh, yes. That's what I'm saying. Be careful who you let leaven. into your church. Mm -hmm. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. The priests kicked him out and cut him off, even though he was still king. Are we doing that today? No. Hmm. If someone comes in with a leper soul that's about to just infect you because it spreads like wildfire, oh, yeah. uh uh. I don't want the spirit of pride here. Yeah, because it's not a physical leprosy, we tolerate. Yes. We tolerate. Let me give you another example yeah. for the modern time since leprosy is hard to. I mean, it's not of this time. But let's think, for example, uh, Let's use um, like a rock star, right? They start up, and we're not going to talk about him and God because <laughs> they hide that part of their life. But let's say their desire to make music that is inspiring, right? It drives them to keep going, and they have the grunge bands in the garages, right? And they, they hang out there every night, and they practice, and they, they just love doing it. They love praising God. Let's call it praising God making music, right? And they practice, and they practice, and they practice, and they do it not for money. Uh, they'll do free gigs even. You go preach for free, right? They'll do free gigs just to see people enjoy their music and enjoy what happens to them when they listen to that music. And that drives them and drives them. And then all of a sudden, a record guy walks into the, go to the band, right? To the bar when they're playing for free. Wow, this is genius. This is genius. We need to sign them right now. They're like, yeah, our dreams are coming true. God is making us prosper, right? Because they were seeking God, remember? They were seeking to impact lives. Their, their ambition was not to, to make money. Yes, they desired that. Yes, it's not wrong to desire that. But they had a passion for music. And they let that passion allow them to make beautiful music that was then recognized by this record dealer, right? He signs them. And they become instant billionaires, right? Because it was so awesome. Yeah. You know, they praise God very well. Ooh, you're moving in and you're building cities and you're building houses and, and vacation homes and taking trips and doing all this and that and the other. All of a sudden, that drive that you had in the garage is now all snuffed by all these other things. The garage all of a sudden seems a little small and dingy and hot to play music in. 
And now it's all about record uh, labels and printing the gold and the silver things and this and that and the other. It became very rich and all of a sudden that thing that was living in you has died. Mm -hmm. And you didn't even realize it. Probably. What happens then? Leprosy comes into your life. You start to do drugs. Oh. Isn't that what happens? Oh. Drugs is a type of leprosy oh. that starts out small. Oh. Okay, we'll smoke some pot. Okay, because you're miserable because you've lost that thing, that light of your life, that, that was your life, that desire to just make something f from the creativity of your heart. To make something beautiful for someone else, not to make something for another statue on your banner. That means nothing. And so they begin to, uh, not everyone, but some begin to smoke weed, do cocaine, yeah. take ecstasy, yeah. and even to the point of heroin. And by, if you feel by the point of error in it, I don't it's, it's, it would only be a miracle that you make it back. Hmm. Hmm. Drugs are very addictive and they're very hard to stop when they come to the point of heroin and cocaine and uh, methamphetamines and all that. It, it becomes very hard, even if you have the desire to. It's it, almost physically impossible. I knew a man that had uh, been clean, this was in high school, he had been clean of heroin for three years. And so all of my friends were non-drug users and they supported him in this and he was a couple years older. And uh, one day I went over there to watch WrestleMania on a Monday, like I always did, and he was just acting really weird. He was just doing profane things and like just gross things and I didn't feel respected, I felt weird. So I left. Five minutes later my friend Kevin calls me and he said, Wes just overdosed. Mm -hmm. He was up in his room with a needle in his throat with his eyes, like in his eyelids, and they had to run him to hospital. And I was so sad when I heard that. He didn't die, so don't cry. He didn't die, but he wanted to die, and I, I haven't spoken to him since, except for one time after that happened, because I didn't feel like I uh, was strong enough to support him through that, and I was also scared of that. Um, and so I, I asked him, when I saw him after he recovered, he was kicked out of his mom's house. Uh, he, he got kicked out of school and was, all these bad things happened because he rebounded. And he said, there's just no point in me living. I don't feel anything anymore. I wanted to die that day. This is what happens when we lose that heart towards God. This is what makes us lose that, that, that thing that made it fun to worship God, that thing that made it a joy to read the scripture, that thing that made it not an obligation, but a privilege. Say, Lord, I have all this work to do today, and I, I'm not going to feel bad that I'm not with you, because you know I have the work I have to do. Just give me five minutes, Lord. Just give me five minutes with you. I know you'll show me something. That's what I'm saying. He can do more with five minutes than five hours if you do it with joy. If you're coming there to just say, I know you've got something for me, you know? That's the kind of spirit. I know you've got something and I know you can tell me in one sentence. <laughs> I know you can tell me in two minutes. I know you can do it. He's not asking us to choose between our jobs and him like that until it, that job becomes an idol. He doesn't want you to live on the street like that because you were just uh, living with him and, and reading scriptures and slacking off at your work. Everything that we do is we do unto the Lord. And so I don't care if I'm preaching or working or, or, or running or cooking. You can pray over the meal and bless it. And so that's what I'm saying about love and the seriousness of getting the leprosy of today and with the mind, uh, the mind infection, you know. And then once one player in the band is doing it, it's likely to spread to the rest of them. It's oh, like wow. evil company corru corrupts, corrupts yeah. good. Yes, good. Habits. And so all of a sudden, what started out as a dream yeah. to make something great uh, has now died, and they don't feel like they feel anymore. And the things on their walls and all the money in the bank it doesn't satisfy them. And so they they lose the the, the, the love, the urge to live. That's they leprosy lost. today. Yeah, yeah. They lost the love and feel. Yes. That's the leprosy of today. Oh, that's <laughs> it's in the mind. Yeah. And they became leprous in their soul. Yes. And it's wow. spread. And then and because of the drugs that they're doing, then they have to rely on that to have a feeling which is fake. And then, that, yeah. you know, it's hard to replace that true feeling when you just run towards God and you say, Hey! That's so sad. I don't care if you give me nothing. I just want to be with you, Lord. Wow, that's so sad. Wow. I just want to be with you. I want to be with you and I know I have all this to do today. Make it quick so that we can have more time together. Mm. 
Make it quick. God does those things. God does those things every single day. But it's out of a joyful heart that those things come. If you go out of obligation, you'll work very hard for a revelation. <laughs> wow. That's a quote right there. <laughs> I like it. I like it. That's so, you that's out, so good. If you do it out of obligation, you'll work hard for a revelation. Yes. And if you do it out of love for the Lord and joy, He'll give you of abundance in five minutes. Oh, yeah. I'm saying five minutes because uh, that's, it's happening. It's happening. Mm. And so, King Osiah was a leper until his death. He didn't repent. He died a leper. And he died a sinner uh, in the spirit. And he dwelt in an isolated house because he was a leper. For he was cut off from the house of the Lord. He went to hell. When Joham, his son, was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. Now the rest of the Acts of Uzziah, from the first to the last, the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, wrote. So Uzziah rested with his father, and uh, he was a leper. So then I asked myself, what did Isaiah say about Uzziah? <laughs> Isaiah, Uzziah, what did they say? <laughs> I became curious, you know? Because I'm like, oh man, there's more. You gave me this passage, but that makes me curious. Very curious. Yeah, I want to know what I see. I'm yeah. a good friend Isaiah. What did he say? Hmm. What happened in Isaiah? What did he say? Hmm. And so obviously it leads me to Isaiah chapter 6. It starts out like this. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two, uh, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And one cried to another one and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the whole house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphims flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth with it, and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, praise God, and your sin is purged, praise God. Yes. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go out for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell his people. Hmm. Woo! Let's step back from that. That's a hot scripture. Hmm. So in the same year that King Uzziah died, the leper has now left the earth. Can you imagine what happens when the leper leaves the church? <laughs> <laughs> Finally, the Lord of hosts will come down and speak in a loud voice, and the angels will come back, and the glory will be filled, and the sin and the transgressions and the iniquity will be purged from you, and you'll be forgiven, and the power of God will come back to the house. Hallelujah. Yes. The power of God will come back. What had happened before that? Yes. Isaiah had been a prophet for five chapters before him, by the way. It wasn't as if he was uh, a David that was anointed and didn't know who he was. Isaiah knew who he was. He was a holy prophet. He was a priest and he wore white garments. And he himself, when God manifested in front of him in a vision, said, I, woe unto me. I'm disgusting. <sighs> that is not what King Uzziah said. <laughs> Even when he had leprosy. <laughs> say that. And so then you can imagine the difference of attitudes that Isaiah is saying. You know, he's not saying, oh, yes, Lord, I see you. I understand you. I'm like you. No. Hmm. Anybody compared to God and Jesus Christ himself is a filthy as a nerd. <laughs> I don't care how many commandments you've kept. <laughs> you know what I had a revelation about after uh, Olu preached about the uh, righteous, uh, young, rich ruler? Young ruler. His first sin was not saying, I'm not going to give my riches. His first sin was saying, I'm innocent. I haven't done any of these things. Yeah. That's what happens when we justify ourselves. We become guilty. It's mm -hmm. the opposite. We say, I'm guilty. And then you justify. Oh. Oh, how about that? I'm always going to say I'm not innocent. <laughs> and I will step into, I am justified. Because that is why Jesus Christ exists, right? Because I 
can't justify myself. We need him. I need him. And I'm not going to uh, let self-guilt. I will let conviction come to me, but self-guilt and guilt from the enemy, I'm not going to let that stop me stepping into my justification that he gives me. Yes. Because that's one of the biggest attacks of the enemy is to make me feel like I don't deserve to be justified because I'm not innocent. Mm -hmm. But that's not how the scripture reads. He says, even though you are not innocent, you're justified. And when people say that they're innocent in the Bible, I've noticed the frequency of events that they are also judged by God. <laughs> and not justified they're by Him. They probably they don't know what they probably. It talks about in Romans that He came to justify those that are sinners. Yeah. And so it, it takes that up, into, up on its head. It turns it around. And so then what else did Isaiah say by King Isaiah? Surely, I'm going to summarize the word. There's five more chapters. <laughs> <laughs> All this in five minutes, guys. That's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm being serious. Five minutes, right before, uh, not all of it, but but this part of Isaiah. Uh, he, sh he just shed light on it. That's why I have to share it. But uh, I didn't have time to underline everything, so you're in luck. We're not going to be here all night. But Isaiah may not have mentioned King Uzziah by name in his writing. Remember, this is while King Uzziah is still alive. Uh, it, it was when he was... Uh, being, uh, his heart was being uh, becoming stronger and becoming lifted up. And so a heart doesn't just go from being humble in the Lord to all of a sudden one day waking up and say, okay, I'm proud today. No. no, it's a process. It goes, just like we go from glory to glory and from faith to faith, we also go from uh, uh, from pride to pride to pride to pride. I guess it's not, it's right. not just like an escalator or a rocket something. ship up. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so I had seen some of these things and I'm just going to point out the details because Isaiah doesn't point them out by name, but it says in verse 1 that these visions were recorded by Isaiah in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, the kings of Judah. The first one is Uzziah, and he didn't die until chapter 6, verse 1, in the year. In the year that King Uzziah died, uh, the prophet Isaiah was anointed. He was finally released. And so you can think about the captivity that the sin of Uzziah had also kept on Isaiah the prophet himself. Because it wasn't until the wicked king died until Christ could be resurrected in Isaiah. And so that's what I'm saying. Be careful who is in your church, who's keeping everyone down so that God can be lifted up. It's so important to know that even though uh, some people reject sinners, right? Just like those uh, uh, drug dealing, uh, drug taking rock band stars, you know, they're all grunged up. They walk into the church and they're like, hey man, you know, I want to hang out. Oh no. We don't do drugs. No, get away. Don't kick him out of the church if he looks weird. There's so much judgment on that. I'd rather you be taking drugs and love the Lord than you, you love the Lord and you do nothing for the Lord. You're just a leper in the church that nobody sees. Oh boy, that's dangerous. Because you know what? God can deliver the drug, the drug addict. But it's harder for him to deliver someone like Uzziah, who just died. Justified himself. And so, I'm just going to summarize because this is something that he revealed uh, in five minutes, talking about, let's put Uzziah, Uzziah in these scriptures and what Isaiah was witnessing. Remember, he loved his country and he loved God more. He loved the people of, of Judea and Israel. He loved them, but he loved God more always. Mm. Can you imagine, Alex, if you were seeing visions of the wickedness of Judah? Can you imagine seeing a vision in your, in your dreams about the wickedness of this and this church? This was God's people. Can you imagine hearing some of these things, let's put it into perspective, a, a, a church that you attend. Could you imagine hearing some of these things as a prophet of God, knowing that they have power over you? Because remember, he was a prophet under the king. You're not going to mention the king's name. Mm. Yeah. You're going to be wiser than that, Alex, okay? Oh, yeah. Don't mention don't mention the name of the church. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just expelling you. <laughs> and so I'll show you with some of these details what he revealed, because yes, he talks about the wickedness of Judah, but who is the king of Judah? It is Uzziah. So he is the head, remember? He had the mark on his head. And so in verse 5, he goes, Why? Should you be stricken again, you will revolt, revolt more and more. The whole head is sick, 
and the whole heart fades. But wounds and bruises are putrefying sores. Remember leprosy. They have not been closed up or bound up or soothed with ointment. Your country is desolate and your cities are burned with fire. Move on to verse 12. <laughs> when you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand? To trample my courts. Remember, he walked into the temple. Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. Wow, I thought offering incense was actually something great. Yeah, I know what Isaiah is talking about. I know. I understand who he was gossiping about without saying the name. <laughs> I love how smart he is and wise he is. <laughs> and then in verse 14, the later part, he goes, My soul hates. They are troubled to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Now listen to this. Wash yourself. Make yourself clean. Mm. Ooh. Unclean is what they call leprosy. That's right, yeah. It goes on in, in verse 25. Ah, I will rid myself of my adversary and take vengeance on my enemies. I will turn my hand against you and thoroughly purge away your dross and take away all your ally and I will restore your judges at the first. And my friends, you can read all these five chapters and see so many similarities between the life of Hosea, uh, Hosea that we just read about and see how God so politely didn't name the wicked man in the writings of Isaiah. Remember, the rich man didn't have a name. Lazarus did. <laughs> the rich young ruler didn't have a name. Lazarus did. <laughs> well, I guess because Uzziah was good in the first part, that's why he had a name. Yeah. And he had, uh, in, in chapter 3, he had mighty men uh, and men of war. And he had the prophets. And then he said in verse 7, I cannot cure your ills. <laughs> and because their tongue... Is, and their doings are against the Lord. Woe to their soul. It shall be ill with him. Therefore the Lord will strike him with a scab, mm. the crown of his head of the daughters of Sion. And instead of sweet smell, sweet smell there will be stench and sackcloth, and you will be desolate and sit on the ground. I'm skipping through fast. Yeah, he was isolated. And then lastly, in chapter 5, will focus in because here it goes back to the earth. The title of this chapter is The Disappointing Vineyard. <laughs> Such a sad chapter. <laughs> the Disappointing Vineyard. Remember, Uzziah planted his own vineyard and loved the earth. He was supposed to be fruitful. He was supposed to be sweet wine. He was supposed to be loving towards God all the rest of his days. However, in verse 2, he built a tower in its midst, and he also made a wine press on it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. It didn't bring on anything good. And then there was an impending judgment. And because they had rejected the law of the Lord of hosts, like he did when he entered the temple, and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel, Therefore, the anger of the Lord is aroused against his people. Again, he didn't murder, but because of what he did, the anger of the Lord was aroused against his people. Mm. He has stretched out his hand against them and stricken them, and the hills trembled. Their carcasses were as refuse in the midst of the street. All this was happening as Uzziah was going from glory to hell. It had an impact on the entire nation. That's why I said, imagine if Uzziah is one of a group, such as the church. Remember, they were of God's, they were God's chosen people. What if you only had one Uzziah? <laughs> Even if he's not the pastor or the leader, there's many leadership roles that you could take. It could be the active leadership role or the other leadership role. It is not well for those people. What should have been sweet wine ends up being disgusting wine. You've all had that wine, right? The two dollar wine. <laughs> it was meant for goodness and glory, but you did so wrong with what you were given. And so today, I just am so excited about expanding the kingdom. And we look at the story of Uzziah and how he was uh, seeking the Lord. 
And then through his expansion of the worldly kingdom, you see him falling further and further away from the Lord, allowing all the glories of the world to become a distraction for him to keep moving forward to God. And then you compare that to David, who was in the wilderness and was still praising God. He didn't have all that glory before. That's who you and I are meant to be. And so don't let what's behind you be in front of you. I heard a quote, and we're going to end with this one tonight because I heard it when you were introducing me. I forgot to say it, and it just came back to my mind. Good. Don't let your limitations challenge you. Challenge your limitations. So don't let the, these things that are challenging for you limit you in moving forward towards God. Instead, challenge the limitations. Say, I know you're holding me back. You know, I'm not all perfect. I got some strongholds, right? Or some things that I'm struggling with. I know I can't get better, but I'm still going to keep going. It's like the ox that has the yoke, right? God breaks every yoke, but if you just stand still, it's not going to fall off. You're going to burst out oh, yeah. and then fall off of you. And so it's like, don't let your limitations challenge you in moving towards the destiny of God. has God take care of that. He doesn't even see that. You know, it's kind of like when you uh, pay attention to something and it gets bigger than it actually is. Yeah. You know, you worry about some event coming up. You know, you're going to meet your in-laws or something for the first time. You get so nervous, so nervous, so nervous, so nervous that you just kind of mess up when it happens, right? Because you've built this thing up in your head. It's being so hard. But instead of looking backwards and looking at the things that God has already put behind us because we're already forgiven, let's keep moving forward. And don't let the challenges limit us in going to our kingdom and expanding our kingdom. Because all this is limited. The earth is limited. It's not expanding. This is expanding. And he has a stronger power over me than that guy. And so I'm always going to be moving that way. He's always going to like tail along afterwards. <laughs> but that was, that's what snakes do. After a while, this is an excellent point uh, in that uh, little saying because... Here's what's going to happen after a while. Even the Bible says your enemies will end up serving you. Exactly. And think about it. And the way that I interpret that in my own life is that I feel the fear. And do it, and it, do it anyway. Use the fear as a fuel to mm -hmm. move forward. Use, use fear. As don't a, look at the fear. Don't, at don't the give fear. it no. any time no, it's, space. A fuel. it's a fuel to move forward. Yes. Run yeah. away from the fear. That's right. And that way that... Enemy called fear is serving me. Yes. It's serving the greater good. The enemy is serving me mm -hmm. instead of me being limited by the enemy and saying and always looking back and say, "Oh, I'm so fearful." Uh, instead, yeah, feel the fear. Mm -hmm. Move forward anyway. Yes. And God will be on your side. Yes. Yeah. And He's bigger than He is. That's right. But when I turn around, I don't see Him anymore. That's right. That's and that right. becomes a very dangerous situation, much like King Uzziah's. And so I don't care what's behind you, yeah. however big it is, in actuality, in real reality, you want to know, if you have a large load behind you, mm -hmm. what happens? God gets more glory. There's going to be a long trail behind you. Be like, oh wow, look at all that weight that they were pulling, right? And, but they still pulled through. But instead we want to just stand and be like, oh, it's too much. You know, it's too much, oh, it's too hard. But it's like, no, 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 no. Let him drive you. And then if you have a ton of uh, things that make you not innocent, right? You gotta make a bigger trail because he's greater. Not just them one sin, that all sin. So, Amen. Amen. I want to encourage you with that word tonight. Amen. Amen. <laughs>